Welcome everyone to Int University's webinar and thank you very much for coming. My name is Charlotte Matlis and I am Int University's Cluster Manager for the North West and Yorkshire, overseeing our centres in Leeds, Liverpool and Manchester. I also oversee our primary academic support programme across the network. I want to start by providing some context to explain why we wanted to host this event and why now seemed like the right time. As we all know, the last few months have been entirely unprecedented and the students that Int University works with have been some of the most adversely affected in the country. As they adjusted to learning from home at the start of the lockdown, a study by the British Psychological Society highlighted the lockdown's negative impacts on young people's mental health due to fear of illness, loss of routines, the impact of loneliness and the disruption to education. They found that young people who belong to groups that are already marginalised or disadvantaged may be particularly at risk and school closures mean a lack of access to the resources they usually have through schools. Another issue facing the young people who we work with is that parents may be struggling to support their children's home learning, especially if they are facing more pressing issues than education. For example, in the first two weeks of lockdown, the Trussell Trust reported 81% more emergency food parcels being given out across the UK, including 122% more parcels going to children compared to the same period in 2019. These findings ring true across Int University's own safeguarding reporting, where we have seen a significant increase in cases of mental health concerns and families in distress amongst our young people compared with the same period last year. And on top of these immediate concerns are more long-term difficulties facing young people from disadvantaged backgrounds in the UK. The Education Endowment Foundation predicts that school closures will widen the attainment gap between disadvantaged students and their peers by up to 75%. A report on COVID-19 and social mobility from May 2020 suggests that disadvantaged pupils are at risk of educational scarring, with the possibility of long-lasting impacts on young people's access to higher education and employability. So, this is some of the context in which we are operating and I now want to briefly outline the work INT University has been doing during this period as we have continued to support our students and their families. Up until March of this year, INT University operated out of our 31 centres and extension projects across England. Our teams ran our innovative academic support programme in centre alongside focus weeks in partnership with local schools and mentoring sessions with both corporate volunteers and university student mentors. With the start of the lockdown, this in-person model suddenly had to change entirely. Instead of students coming into centre for our academic support programme, our teams instead delivered it over the phone, providing homework help and academic tasks, as well as pastoral support. As the lockdown continued, we adapted the academic support programme to be accessed via email or using an online platform, but we continued to provide telephone support for our students without access to a computer, which has been a key barrier to education facing many young people during this period. As of the 10th of July, our team has provided support to almost 3,300 individual students and their families through a grand total of 27,022 successful academic support calls. This means each student has received an average of eight calls from our teams during the lockdown, providing consistent academic and pastoral support during these uncertain times. Mentoring meetings have gone virtual as well, as we set up systems for mentors to support their mentees over the phone or by video call. We have provided resources to our partner schools to support year six students transition to secondary school and over the summer we are continuing to share fun and educational activities for our students to do with their parents and siblings. To continue to support our young people with their employability we have also adapted our student enrichment programs to run online this year. Our big city bright future internship has been adapted into three weeks of virtual sessions delivered by a range of corporate partners. You'll hear more about this in the second panel today. 
another student enrichment programme, our Academy of Enterprise, is running webinars for over 100 students every day this week, aiming to inspire young people with a hands-on experience of being an entrepreneur. As a cluster manager, I'm proud of the high quality level of support we have provided for our students, despite the challenges and uncertainty of working remotely. Many staff teams have seen positive developments in their relationships with our young people, as the phone calls enable them to offer students more individual support than when we are all in centre. Staff also have a better understanding of their students' home context and have developed stronger relationships with parents and carers, which will undoubtedly benefit our students when we return to centre. Looking ahead, we are acutely aware that our support will be more needed than ever to help bridge the gap of lost learning and enable students to achieve their aspirations. We have appointed a new Head of Learning Recovery to coordinate this work and support our young people with the after effects of the pandemic. Through our centre-based model, we are already embedded in local communities and have long-standing relationships with schools, families, universities and businesses in each place. In the coming months, we will focus on tailoring our programmes and approaches to best serve our young people, working to understand the individual needs of schools and our students. And as with all our programmes, we will take a holistic approach, putting the mental health and well-being of our students at the foundation of recovery moving forward. To sustain and continue to grow our network of learning centres, we have also launched our Staying Focused fundraising campaign to raise three million pounds by August 2021. This will enable us to support more than 40,000 students across the country in the next academic year and reach even more young people as we will be opening new centres in Scotland, Norwich and the North East of England. At a time when educational support is needed more than ever, this campaign is about allowing students to stay focused on their education and our teams to stay focused on providing the highest quality support for our students. Having outlined the context and what we've been doing, the remainder of this event will not be focusing on the work of inter-university, but rather the experiences and stories of our students, volunteers and schools. As the academic year has now ended and the lockdown is easing, we wanted this event to be an opportunity to reflect on the last few months, on their challenges and achievements, and to discuss the ongoing need for educational and pastoral support for young people. We hope that this event will amplify these important voices and will be a valuable insight opportunity to listen to and engage with people on the front line of the pandemic in our sector. Before I hand over to my colleague Luke for the first panel, I have a few practical points to outline. First, you should be able to see a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, which you can use to ask questions of any of our speakers and the panel chair will pass your questions on to the panelists. If you would like to tweet about this event, please use the hashtag stories from the front line. And as with all virtual events, we are very much hoping that everything will run smoothly, but please do bear with us if there are any technical issues along the way. Now, thank you once again for being here and I'll hand over to my colleague Luke to introduce the first panel discussion. Good morning, everyone. Um, so this section is basically going to focus on student stories and essentially what their experiences of learning has been like under lockdown. Um, so just as a quick introduction to myself first, I am the centre leader of the Hackney Down Centre um, and I previously worked at our Hackney South and East Ham Centre since joining into university in January 2018. I have supported the Student Advisory Panel to provide guidance and insights to the charity and have also helped coordinate the Student Associate Network platform, IU Connect. Um, so alongside me, we are here with three of our Student Advisory Panellists. Um, first, we have Abdullahi, and Abdullahi is from our Hackney South Centre and is currently in his second year at Soash University studying Social Anthropology. As well as being on the Advisory Panel, he is a member of Hackney Youth Parliament and his goal in the future is to become a motivational speaker. Um, also alongside us, we have Adil, who is from our Nottingham Central Centre. Um, and as well as being on the Student Advisory Panel, he is also an academic support volunteer. 
He is in his final year at De Montfort University studying economics and has a passion to become an economist for the civil service. And then finally, but last but not least, uh, we have Samira. Samira is from our Nottingham West Centre. Um, she has just completed her undergraduate studies in politics and international relations at the University of Nottingham. And outside of academia, um, she has also worked with a number of charities that focus on youth empowerment and is looking forward to pursuing a career in the public sector. Um, so just before we get started, um, just as mentioned, there will be some Q and um, question and answer sections. So if you do have them, um, I will try to get through those um, as quickly as possible. Um, but firstly, this question is for all of the panel, but um, I am going to ask Abdullahi first, um, just to briefly explain in a couple of minutes your experience of learning under lockdown. Hi everyone. So um, my experience of learning during lockdown has been interesting and challenging at the same time in the sense that because um, while whilst in, during my second year, I like when lo lockdown started, everything had to move online, and so it was very interesting for me to kind of like see how I, I was going to manage learning online, but also challenging in the sense that I wasn't going to have physical support of not only my lecturers but also tutors so learning during lockdown has been kind of I, I would say for me also life-changing because I'd have to also do my second year exams and um, during lockdown I had to do it online so it was kind of um, very um, strange for me to kind of like, do my revisions on my own like how kind of the like my friends like support we we didn't have like a physical meeting so it'll, everything had to be done virtually so like learning during lockdown has been kind of a new skill that I had to get used to um, and also it's also a new skill that I have to get used to for my uh, for the next academic year as well so I would say like, for me it's been both interesting and challenging. Perfect thank you very much and Adil the same question for you how was how have you found your um, experience of learning throughout lockdown? Sorry, I was muted there. Um, yeah. I think I would pretty much echo what Abdullahi said, but just to add on to, the, add on to, that, add on to that slightly, um, in terms of my education and my studies, I am a very people's person. So in terms of revising or doing my group work, where in some seminars we had to do um, a team presentation, it was very difficult to adjust to that and finding mutual times where everyone could meet virtually um, to ensure that we get all the um, content down for our presentations and then record our own individual pieces. I think that was very difficult to maneuver and kind of organize. Um, but again, adjusting to that, using everything virtually, using universities' new systems that they had produced purely because of lockdown, um, I think that was one of the difficult things that I had to adjust to. And also adjusting to not being able to like physically be in study groups. As mentioned before, I am a people's person, so I enjoy discussing, especially studying such a broad topic as economics. It's really interesting to discuss that with people while you're revising for your exams um, and generally during university. Um, so I think pretty much adjusting to not being able to have those open discussions as much as I would have done when I would have been in the university um, at the library. But that pretty much sums up how I've been learning during lockdown. Perfect. Thank you very much. And then finally, just Samira, the same question for you. How have you found your experience so far under, under lockdown? Um, well, I think um, particularly because I'm in my final year of university now, I think the most interesting thing for me was understanding how I would complete my dissertation without the library and all the books that I needed for my dissertation. Um, so that was rather interesting because it meant I had to just be quite resourceful and find new ways to find data. Um, and also because I was doing a lot of my research over the telephone now instead of going out and meeting people, um, I think it was really interesting for me to see how I could adapt to that individually um, but also with the resources that my university provided but it's been an interesting experience I think um, the fact that like Abdullahi and Adil mentioned um, you're all of a sudden you don't have your support network from your peers and you don't have that bubble of friends that actually help you through university when it gets quite difficult I think that perhaps was the most difficult part for me but apart from that I think finding innovative ways to really deal with the pandemic has been an interesting challenge. Cool yeah lovely and just, I know we've just mentioned that sort of um, 
being around your peers and sort of having open discussions about your course um, could often be quite challenging. Um, but Adil, how did you overcome that? Did you say or what sort of techniques did you put in to make that process easy for you throughout your studies? Um, I think it was generating um, group chats. So within our seminars. So I did have quite a few of my friends on social media, but we didn't talk as much on social media because we were meeting up regularly. So I think it was coordinating those group chats, finding mutual times, because a lot of my friends lived across the UK. So they were transitioning from moving out of Leicester, um, going back home, but following the lockdown rules in terms of traveling. So that kind of transition took a few weeks. But once that kind of settled down, I think during those few weeks, it was the most difficult because I wasn't able to contact them as much as possible. So it was on my own premises to go and do my own research, as Samira mentioned, and go and find my own data for my um, assignments and prepping for my exams. Um, but then once that kind of basis was set in terms of our group chats, our video calls, um, and literally not being afraid to go and ring up my friend and say at, at late hours, because that's generally what, when we would do our revision. Um, and I think everyone was of understanding of that. And we would be, we are in unprecedented times and we are going to be working at different times, especially like juggling my part-time job, which was really difficult because I made use of not being at university. Um, so it was trying to juggle all of that. Um, but I think that's the main way where I kind of made sure I stayed in that bubble. And um, after that transition where I wasn't able to be in that bubble, if that makes sense. Yeah, cool. Um, and then just leading on from that, um, Samira, I know you said that um, just being away from the library made it quite difficult, um, particularly studying sort of politics and international relations. It's very sort of, it does require sort of a lot of reading and a lot of um, books. So how did you um, manage to, or how did you find that sort of transition period and how did you overcome that? Okay, thank you, Luke. Um, I think a lot of students will be able to agree with me when I say that it's much easier for you to do your work when you have a space for learning and a space for you to just rest from learning. And all of a sudden when your bedroom becomes not only your library, but also your social space and this place where you rest actually becomes really difficult for you to detach yourself from the strenuous work that comes at university. Um, so I say that's definitely been a challenge, especially because now I'm in a home where everyone's working from home. There aren't many quiet spaces in the house for me to find time and space to do my work um, so a way that I sort of adapted and challenged I think was essentially just creating boundaries within the home like this is my working space and then making sure it wasn't in the same space where I tried to rest or the same space where I tried to sleep because I think that's really important for motivation I think um, I'm sure Vallahi and Adit will agree with me but doing work in your bedroom just essentially over time becomes actually quite difficult because you're very tempted to just rest because your bed is right there I think finding that space was difficult for me in the beginning, but now that I've been able to establish well, actually the dining room is my space. So if I'm there doing work, people understand that actually, well, my family understand that um, this is Samara's time to work and everyone just respecting each other's boundaries made it a lot more easier. Um, but yeah, I had to learn very quickly that my bedroom wasn't the right place for me to study or do my work. Um, and when I did overcome that, it became a lot easier for me to focus and also had time to rest as well without feeling guilty about having so much work to do. Yeah. Okay, that, that's, that's really good. Um, and then this question I'll put towards Abdullahi, um, just because I know um, during your second year as well, you did mention to me that there was a change in um, the way you did your assessments throughout your second year at university. Um, so would you be able to explain sort of um, how the assessments changed and how you felt about that? So the assessments, so we usually, like, so us, we usually have, like, essay writing and then exams. So the assessment mainly came with the exams. So the exams, it was open book. So we had access to like readings and kind of just like also with group chats as well, which wouldn't happen if there wasn't like a uh, lot. It would, it would just mainly be like doing revision and kind of like doing like have mentally, having mentally done your readings for your exams. So my, the changes came around the exams where but while while you're writing your exams, you you have access to reading. So, and for me, that was also kind of also like strange, but also like good because it was kind of like interesting to me to see how I kind of gauged to see how well I would do now that I, I actually have like my readings in front of me, where whereas before I wouldn't. So, it, I I kind of found it like challenging and nerve wracking because I felt like now that I'm doing my exams, I felt like like markers of my exams 
um, expected a lot more from us now, now that we have like, our readings in front of us to kind of help us with the answers of our exams. So I, I, I felt like the changes to assessment was good, but I, I also felt a bit of pressure knowing that I had to kind of perform extra, extra well. Um, because I, I didn't, didn't know that we have this to be so I, to be honest, I did I did feel a lot of pressure from there. And would I am nervous because this week we'll, we'll start getting our results of our exam. So hopefully I did do as well as I expected or all better. So we'll see. Okay. And just I know you just mentioned sort of feeling the pressure in a sense, but just to add on from that, um, do you feel like you were able to produce the same level of work or same quality level of work being at home as opposed to whether he was at university um, during the transition? Yeah, I, I would definitely would say I was able to like, produce the same level of work and um, kind of similar to what um, Samira and, I, and um, what um, I just said because my my family were very supportive of like because they know like when it's time for me to work they know it's good and they I'm very grateful because they they'll give me the space and I didn't I don't even have to like let them know that I have to work. They would just like especially they were very supportive during my exam period. They would give me my space to because I for my exams I had um forty eight hours to kind of produce my, my the answers to the question. So my, my, my family were very supportive to the that they would give me like my time and my space to kind of do my work. So I definitely say um I was I made I was able to kind of produce the same level. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much for sharing. Um, and this question is for you, Adil, because I know you mentioned as well that um, you have a part-time job. Um, so my question for you is how did you find like juggling the part-time job alongside your studies at university? Um, simply put, very, very difficult. So I'm, I'm normally working at a leisure centre, but obviously all leisure centres closed down um, as soon as lockdown hit. Um, and it wasn't feasible for me to um, carry on during the summer without a part-time job. Um, and then I did find another job at ASDA. Um, so I did technically become a key worker during the lockdown, which was very, very difficult. Um, I was working so early morning shifts, so between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. starts, all the way up to midday to 2 p.m. in the afternoon. Um, and then I was literally coming home, having a nap, and then prepping for my exams and assignments. Um, and as Abdullah mentioned, the assignments and exams had changed, so they were all online. So adjusting to that, um, finding books and um, things that I would have usually found in the library, literally you got to friend and go and grab the book. Um, it was a lot more difficult. Online resources are slightly more harder to find because they cost or they're a little bit more difficult to find. Um, so it was very difficult, um, but I knew it wasn't possible for me to go on ahead without a part-time job, supporting myself and supporting my family. Um, and as they did put a lot of pressure on me, so in the end, eventually, I did have to hand in my resignation because it was affecting me mentally. Um, I think the whole lockdown, the university pressure, and then having to juggle a job um, did get quite difficult. So I gave myself a, like a couple of weeks break. Um, and since then, I have found another part-time job, which is a lot better. Um, but I think those two and a half months were extremely difficult. Um, and it wasn't kind of in terms of breaking point, in terms of physically and mentally, because it was a lot of pressure bombarding me all at once. Um, but I think because I had a, a good key network and support at home, but also I kept in touch with my local centre um, and we had like weekly calls and it was kind of like offloading on them, but which was extremely, extremely helpful, like hats off to them because they were working all hours, bringing all the students from academic support, but also keeping in touch with volunteers like myself. Um, so I think I, I really, really appreciate that. And that was definitely one of the major factors that did help me control that pressure. Cool. Um, and that's really good to see how proactive you've been in sort of going or having a sort of tricky situation and then being proactive in sort of doing the things that you need to do to make sure that you're keeping on top of your mental health, but also your studies as well. Um, so that's really good for me to hear, but also I'm sure everyone else as well. Um, and then Samira, um, my question for you is essentially around um, the support that you got from your university. Um, mm -hmm. Just because with the transition, I'm sure that comes with a lot of things um, being done virtually, um, whether that's um, doing things online or having access to like laptops. And then just my question for you is sort of um, what challenges were there, would you say, from your university and did you essentially feel supported um, from your university as well? Okay, 
thank you, Luke. Um, so as I mentioned before, I'm actually a final year university student. Um, and so I think the university had a particular interest in making sure that actually we weren't disadvantaged when it came to collecting our final year results. Um, so in terms of academic support, I'd very much say that my university was quite supportive. We had a lot of resources, um, a lot of online access to books that we hadn't had before because we didn't have access to the library. Um, in terms of pastoral support, although there was a lot of effort from my students' union to sort of reach out to students, making sure we were okay, creating study groups, creating social groups, and even like online workout classes. Um, I'd say in terms of pastoral support, I would have loved to have seen my university perhaps reach out a bit more, perhaps my department reaching out to more students, asking them what sort of department and subject specific support I could have had from the university. Um, but I think it was a really challenging time, especially for professors and lecturers who were dealing with this pandemic and having to teach in a whole new way. Um, so no fault laid on them, but I think that would have been really helpful to see what actually, this is a really incredible way for universities to show that they have the ability to provide pastoral support. So I would love to have seen more of it um, now that I've graduated and now I can look back in hindsight, I think there wasn't nearly enough contact between the universities and students in terms of looking out to make sure the students were okay in the sort of emotional and mental health sort of state. Um, but outside of that, the academic support I'd say particularly because I was a final year student, um, was great from Nottingham. Um, but yeah, I think that was quite difficult at the beginning, especially when it was, um, a lot of us were just essentially going from being around people all the time to being alone in our rooms and doing lectures. I think it would have been really helpful to see actually what sort of support we had around that so we didn't feel so alone. Yeah, perfect. And um, just from speaking from that sort of level of support, I want to bring this to you, Abdullahi, one, because I know... Um, that you'll be going back to university next year as well. Um, but how do you feel, first of all, how do you feel like the support was at your university? And just secondly, have you been in con or has the university been in contact with you in regards to what their plans are for September? Yeah, so um, in terms of support, like SOAS was actually um, very helpful in the sense that because we, we couldn't like, they couldn't see students like, physically, so they, they've been kind of doing everything through email and my department, my pathology department, they've been very um, supportive in terms, in terms of like, um, communicating to, to anthropology students and um, letting them know kind of like what changes are, are taking place and how, how exams are going to happen. And the same with like academic support as well, when the lecturers and professor, professors, they were very, they were very open to kind of like um, supporting students in, in terms of like, if, if it's emails or doing having virtual meetings, they were very open to that up until when it came to exam period because they were there for revision, but also they, were, they would also let us know kind of essays as well if we need any support because it was interesting actually. Because this year I would say it was my first time I, I had to apply for um, mitigating circumstances. So, and my department was very helpful in the sense that they did, they, they, they had informed me on how how to do that because I'd actually never done it before. So um, it was kind of like it was locked down that kind of helped me learn how the process worked. And in terms of going back in September, um, so as has been kind of putting in place kind of what the changes that would kind of have to happen because right now, um, so as has constantly been having meetings on the, something called like transformation. So in terms of like keeping the buildings buildings and resources safe and how students student are going to be safe at uni. So I would say going back in September, I for me I would I would for me I would say I would like to see kind of just like reassurance that everything is safe because I'd actually have to sign like a letter to to like the um, IROC and so on kind of like mention uh, the changes that not only me but also other students would like to see to assure that everything is Cool. Thank you very much. Um, and we've only got five-ish minutes left, so I've just got a couple of more questions. Um, and thank you for the questions that are coming in. They're really um, helpful and informative. Um, but this one is for um, Samira. And just, do you find that sort of um, you've had to maybe juggle more family responsibilities alongside your studies um, because of lockdown? Um, and if so, sort of like, how have you um, managed that? Thank you, Luke. Um, so I'm 
very lucky that I have four siblings. So in this house right now, there are seven people um, in lockdown. Everyone's back from university. So it's a quite an interesting and exciting house. Um, in terms of familial responsibilities, I say definitely because I'm now that I'm not at university, I'm here at home and having to make sure that I'm doing my part also in the house. Um, but in terms of overcoming those initial challenges, I think I'm quite lucky in that I have a really wonderful support network in my mum and dad in that actually anything that I'd need, if I needed actually just a break from everyone in a few days just to get through some work, I think they're very, very understanding in that. And I think in that respect, I'm quite lucky that I have the support I have from my home, knowing that actually a lot of my friends perhaps are not in such a privileged position. Um, so overcoming that initially was interesting, but it opened up a really new conversation that I was able to have with my parents. Um, in terms of responsibilities, now that I've officially finished all my work, um, it very much is just making sure that, yeah, I'm having open, honest conversations with my parents about what it is I need to do now that I'm at home and not at university. Um, and it's been an interesting conversation so far, and I'm sure Abdullahi and Adil, now that you're both at home as well, it's been quite an interesting transition going from being at university to being at home. Um, but I'm very lucky that with the support of my family, that it's, hasn't been too difficult for me. Okay, that's good. Um, and then just to... Can, well, our last couple of questions, I think, if we can get them in. Um, but just, Adil, what would you say? I know we spoke about a lot of challenges um, throughout learning through lockdown, but what would you say maybe your are successes or key successes that you could take away from this period as well? Um, I think my key successes were um, I'm generally quite adaptable. Um, and although in this case I'd never experienced it before, and I think a lot of us haven't expected ex ex experienced this before so I think in terms of my adaptation it was as slow as I would have adapted to a different situation but I think the way that I adapted to everything in terms of juggling home life university life work life and also the main thing being able to adjust not being in that in the friends uh, group in the friends bubble so to speak um, I think that was one of my biggest successes um, but also another success that I think I would say that I did have was I was due to do a summer internship and obviously due to the circumstances that COVID-19 brought about I was unable to do that um, and the firm weren't able to offer that virtually so I was in contact with them for quite a while and it has been postponed to next year um, but in terms of going out and finding more virtual experience um, and at first I did kind of start wallowing and I did get upset in terms of all my summer internships ended and I was really looking forward to spending um, my summer in London eight weeks in a big firm and it was something that I really really looked forward to and that did quite knock me um, but then going out online looking for virtual experiences um, and I did this secure three virtual experiences so I was really really happy that I was able to do that and they were all in sectors that I, would, I am hoping to um, pursue in the future or considering to pursue in the future I think I think that was another uh, major success for myself personally speaking perfect thank you very much um i think that was that was our final question and um, there were loads to go through and apologies that we didn't manage to go through them all um but just a big thank you to abdullahi adil and samira just for taking the time out of your day to sort of um enlighten us about your experiences um of learning through lockdown um it's really appreciative and i'm sure that everyone that's listening in will go away and just have some key things to either take away and discuss with their peers as well um so thank you very much for your time um and thank I think you for having us that's okay much, no problem. i think now i will pass over um to sharon who is going to host the next part um, of the panel discussion Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you again so much for coming along. Um, it's really great to see so many attendees. We are going to focus now on volunteer stories and what our volunteers have found under lockdown in terms of their volunteering experiences. So our panelists today, we have um, Charlotte, who is a mentor for Mariam, who is here as well. And then we also have Wesley, who has been participating in the Big City Bright Future internship and is a business analyst at Kearney. So I'll let you introduce yourselves and talk a bit about your experiences volunteering. And um, Charlotte, would you like to go first? 
Um, I'm Charlotte, I'm a marketing manager at Selborne Chambers. Um, so I've been with Selborne for about three years. Um, I was introduced to into university when I joined Selborne um, and I was just very keen to volunteer myself. So I started looking into ways as a business, as individuals, we could um, support into university further. And that's when I came across the corporate mentoring scheme and applied. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Wesley, would you like to go next? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Wes. Um, I'm a business analyst at Carney, which is a management consulting firm in London. I joined straight out of university, studied economics at Bristol. And I've been working with Kearney, offering our internship for Big City Bright Future. Um, I've had a few engagements with Inter University in the past. Um, I've met I've met some of you and some of your students at these uh, careers events. It's been really insightful. Um, yeah, we had a lot planned for our in-person internship, so I'm quite gutted COVID happens, but that's probably a small, small inconvenience in light of the wider situation. But um, we've still made the most of it, offering a virtual internship that I think some of you recognise some of your names have attended. So, yeah. Thank you very much. And Mariam, would you like to introduce yourself as well? Yep. Hi, I'm Mariam, and I just finished year 13, sixth form, um, and I've been with Inti University for three years now, and I also participated in the Big City Bright Future. Thank you very much. So just to kick off our question, so practically I'd like to find out a bit more about what your volunteering experience has been like um, under lockdown. So to start with you Charlotte, um, you were mentoring Mariam before lockdown, how did that change once lockdown did start for you? I think for us the first thing was just working out what we were comfortable with because we we're obviously moving from face to face and whether telephone meetings were best for us or virtual meetings and I think we were really lucky because we were contacted quite quickly by into universities so we had no lull in our meetings sort of the momentum stayed um, so that was sort of the big the biggest part for us was going from face to face to telephone which we decided was our best option um, so, and I think also previously our meetings have been really task orientated and then suddenly overnight, schools are closed, exams have been cancelled and our meetings turned to more of a discussion and a catch up because everything was very uncertain and kind of our plan that we thought we would be doing at this stage was became very redundant because revision techniques or plans weren't needed. Yeah, that's really interesting. And how did you find it, Mariam, kind of having to adjust to that kind of set up plan that you made initially to have to adapt something quite different yeah i mean i think it was challenging at first because like we used to like meet every month somewhere and like there's always something to do that was like school related or something but like you know my exams were cancelled and i had like this whole chunk of time with nothing to do and it was kind of just like figuring out like what i could do to support myself how like charlotte can support me and all that kind of stuff but i think i think we did well i think we kind of like adjusted after like a few like after like the first session we figured out you know what we can like fill our time with and all that kind of stuff which is good brilliant that's really really good to hear um coming to you Wes um you were obviously part of the big city bright future scheme um how did you find kind of having to try and engage with young people um but virtually sure so um in my role in the scheme part of what i did was we had our we had assigned buddies who are essentially the interns that we had accepted that would have come to our program. So I've had two out of three calls with my nan. It's been, it's going really well. I think, um, I think I would prefer personally in person, but we've made the most out of what we can do. And, um, my, my buddy, he's really, uh, he's really practical. So he's grilling me on loads of questions about how to make the most out of this situation, which is making me wish I had a little crystal ball because, I haven't been in a pandemic before, but I can apply my experience in having been through the job market and the application process. So trying to really coach him on that. And um, yeah, no, it's going well. And I think I've, it's also made me learn to appreciate like, you know, I'm, I'm only 22. I, sometimes I feel like, why do, why do I have all the answers? But actually I've been through a pretty, um, a pretty grueling interview process and I've done it over and over again. So happy to share what I've learned with that. And it's been, I can feel he's really engaged with it. So. It's felt good. And how did you find building a relationship with your buddy, having never met 
kind of in person, but having to build a relationship mm -hmm. around, um, virtually. Mm -hmm. So, um, probably a bit of a cop out answer, but I'd actually met mine in person at a at one of the panel events that were in person with Inter University. He um, and he actually engaged with us, and he kind of impressed me there. And I also. I was doing the interviews for our firm, so that was another interaction with him. So actually by our first like buddy call, I'd already spoken to him twice. So in that respect, it wasn't completely alien. But um, in terms of building a report over the phone, it does require, a, it requires, I think, having a little more, injecting a little bit more enthusiasm into your voice. You don't get the face-to-face -face connection and sort of reading the insights. But um, so yeah, I feel it was a little bit, I think it started a little bit more formalized than I would have liked, but I think that's natural. I think, you know, students are trying to sound professional and be like, you know, impressed. But after, after a while, it sort of, it became very natural and started to flow and really just asking, I got the point across that you can ask any question, no matter how big, how small. I don't care if you're asking me about what are the best things I should put on my CV to like, what kind of shoes go with this tie? Like, I don't care. Cause those are the kind of questions that like, I wish I had someone to ask when I was applying because it is, it is even just the little things that can stress you out. So, yeah. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, to come to you, Charlotte, um, obviously you were already mentoring Mariam before lockdown. Um, it was, was there a particular, did you find that you felt your responsibilities change in some way, kind of help, helping somebody through the lockdown period? As we said, like none of us have been in a pandemic before. So did you find that there was an extra responsibility that you felt like you had in order to help support her? Yeah, I think it changed a lot. It went from kind of a very practical, um, you know, task, almost theory relationship to something sort of more pastoral. We were kind of catching up and checking in. Um, and it felt, yeah, more, certainly more pastoral, more just sort of, discussing how we'll cope with the lockdown, the changes, the waiting to hear what would happen with exam results. It was more sort of just being there to listen and sort of, sort of just making sure that Marion was aware that, you know, I was there to listen to any concerns because obviously there was so much uncertainty and we all, I know how I was feeling and I would not had so much change overnight for me. No, definitely. I understand that. Um, and from your side, Mariam, um, how did you find, what kind of support did you feel like um, Charlotte was able to help with um, during lockdown? Yeah, um, I feel like when I, whenever like I talk to Charlotte, I feel like a lot of the times I was like concerned about the uncertainty that came with, like, you know, I'm in, that, I'm in year 13 and I had like my A-levels and like they were all cancelled and it was like, would I get to uni I like, get the grades I need it was just like Charlotte would like kind of like rationalize things and help me just like you know like, break it down and be like you're in a safe like you're in a safe position you know you have these grades you know you you don't need to worry too much just take it easy because at this point there's no point in worrying and that kind of stuff so I think it was like really useful yeah brilliant and I have a question from um the attendees for you Mariam um what are your plans for September? Um, how has kind of lockdown affected those plans? So I hope to I hope to start um, studying at university um, politics at LSE, um, but and I, I really hope that does go ahead. But it's just like everything like now is kind of like on hold until results day because my university they did say that if you don't get the grades they will um, defer your place for next year, but you will need to take your exams. So like right now, for example, I I really want to just like put like all my A-level notes and stuff like away, but I still have them sort of out in case, last um, worst case situation, I do need to like start studying for them again because I still don't know. But August is literally like two, three days away and the results day will be here and then I'll be able to, you know, have a clearer plan about what's happening in September, but hopefully it'll be university. Thank you so much. And coming to you, Wes, um, I'd like to hear more about what you would feel the main successes have been for you um, volunteering virtually. Um, has there been certain lessons that you've learned that you've been able to take away from this quite unique situation? 
Sure. So I think one of the more practical elements of water well is that we were able to get like large crowds to the webinar, right? Like there's no limit to the amount of people we can have. And that was really good because it means that we could um we could get all of our consultants on one call at once and then all of us share our insights and different views. And I think it meant we had one really powerful, valuable event rather than a few that not that they wouldn't be valuable, but you know, I think one really one really strong one is better than three like good ones. So if there's that. And secondly, what I found, which was, I didn't expect at all, but I think was really cool, was like the anonymous Q&A questions got really tough and challenging. And I guess there's an element of because, well, like you're not in person. So it was really good to see everyone on the spot and giving those honest answers because like the tough, difficult questions are the ones that need answering, right? And are the ones that 18-year-olds um, need these insights to, to know really if this is the kind of career they're interested in. I'd also say as well, like don't be don't be shy in asking those kind of questions when you are doing an in-person event because yeah they, they will appreciate them like everyone was 18 once and knows that those are the kind of questions that you want to answer get answered so would you say more so that those who might have been more naturally kind of shy or reserved were asking more questions because they were able to or felt more comfortable to virtually I would have to assume that, yeah, because I think the, the number of questions was simply so much greater than you would get in person, right? Like normally in person, realistically, it's a shame, but you probably only get the, I don't know, 15% of the most like confident, outgoing people putting their hands up and everyone else doesn't. But here, no, it was questions all across the board on all kinds of topics from all different kinds of people. So it was, it was really good to see that. And hopefully like at least someone listens to this now and realizes they should put their hand up and speak more often because... It can't go badly, but all questions are good questions. I agree. Um, a question for all three of you. Um, would you like to continue volunteering virtually or rather than transitioning back to face-to-face? -face, um, do you feel, feel like virtual volunteering or support is better compared to face-to-face? -face? Um, Marion, what do you think? I think a combination of both would be good because I think like it's always great to like meet in person but it's, all, it's also not always practical for example like I know like for example if if like I, when I start uni it might like not always be possible compared to um a sixth form student who could like you know like stay um make it make it a bit more practical to meet up but I think like I think both are great and I think both of them have value so I'll be happy to like do either whatever's like easier for me or Charlotte or whoever our mentor would be. Charlotte, what do you think? I think I definitely agree with Marion there. A hybrid of the two is really good. I think we were also really lucky that we had six months of meeting in person. So by the time we went to virtual mentoring, we were really comfortable. Um, so it, it made going to telephone meetings much easier. Um, but I think moving forward, having kind of the hybrid means that you won't miss a month if if we're both particularly busy or we can't make the same time, we're more likely to be able to make a phone call. So I think sort of mixing the both is definitely positive. And I think moving forward, that is a much better option than, than missing a month because we can't meet up. And Wes? Yeah, I think um, I don't want to give the same answer as the other two, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, I think I think the mentoring, I think I wish I'd had the opportunity to do that in person, I must admit. I think that whilst there is the element of practically being able to rearrange it, I think that especially with those initial meetings, right, you just build so much more of a connection in person. So I think I prefer to do that in person. Then with the volunteering, I think it was a bit of both. So on one hand, as I searched on before, I think the element of simply getting to have so many students there at once and have all your consultants on the line is like so powerful like that one event was so much better than splitting it up into like five breakout rooms but then on the other hand again like I think there's just a personal touch that is a little bit a lot stronger in person so it's pretty tough on the volunteering side but yeah I'd say perhaps we should go with a bit of both and this is a question from Mariam um, kind of thinking about you going to university next year um, how do you anticipate you'll find that transition to online learning? I know a lot of the um, students in the last panel were kind of talking about how they felt and their experiences. Um, how do you feel like you will kind of cope with that transition potentially to online learning? Hmm. 
I think like I think like one of the main things about most of university being online or the first term at least is mainly like the social aspect of it because like I think in the first few weeks of uni that's when you like kind of like get make your friends like meet most people so that's something I'm slightly worried about but in terms of the learning aspect I feel like one of the benefits of lectures and seminars and tutorials being online is that at least they're recorded you might be able to like do them in your own time and go back like I know like a lot of people say that they like in lectures they're always like trying to like catch up with what the lecturer is saying because they don't stop with you but I feel like that's something that you kind of get to evade if it's online but I think my main concern is um, just like the fact that if it means that I'll be at home, studying at home might not be the best environment. Um, but I think I'll be able to, I'll be able to adjust because my sister's also at university, so she might she might like also be studying. So like we kind of have that understanding that we're both like have stuff to do. Yeah, definitely. Um, thinking about kind of got volunteering going forward, um, do you think that this has kind of presented new opportunities for people to volunteer in the future um, in ways they might not have thought of? Um, so do you think in the future there might be more opportunities for people to volunteer virtually and maybe potentially expand their reach to beyond their local area, but even like globally? Um, do you think that might be a way that volunteering might go in the future? Um, where should we start with you? Yeah, absolutely. I think like the I think the geographic aspect of it is critical. I think like there's probably there's probably students such as the ones on this call, but like all over, I don't know, like, in the countryside, remote places, like you know, or just simply far away from like where the mentors are. So I think that that's just absolutely critical. I think that you know, whilst it's great where everyone's got, I think it should be extended to absolutely all students across the country so that element i also think it's good that um it's really made firms like us become inventive in how we do things like you know we had an idea for our in-person internship right but we really just had to go back to the drawing board and think from scratch for how we would deliver this virtual case and i think it's it's really just opened us up to delivering some different kind of value which is cool because it means you you guys aren't just getting the same thing every time so you know you put us on our toes but i think it's creates some better value for everyone Okay. And Charlotte? Um, yeah, I think so. I think for me, it would allow me to do more because I could sort of give more time volunteering. So I'm losing the travel time. And I think also for a number of our members, they're not necessarily based in London. Um, so it would give them the opportunity to work within two university within London, but also those outside London. Um, so I think, yeah, the virtual is, it, it makes it more accessible for people and people will feel less worried about making the commitment because I think they'll feel more comfortable committing to the volunteering, knowing they can do it virtually. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. Um, it just makes you think in terms of um, kind of working from home and juggling your workload with volunteering, have you found that to be easier? Um, have you found you've been more flexible or has it been more difficult because of having to strike a work-life balance and um, how have you found kind of juggling that? I, found, I would say I found it much easier having said that sort of before we had the catch-up we sort of pre-planned them I would then plan in advance my week round kind of my my mentoring session you know, that I was an afternoon short so I would say it there's definitely less pressure because it doesn't take up so much of my work day um, and I can kind of have more time to prepare. Um, so I think the virtuals have, have really, really worked well. Yeah, and would you say the same way as in terms of your workload, it's been quite manageable to juggle both? Oh, absolutely. Being virtual just makes it so much easier. You, you know, you gain you gain an hour, two hours back of your day, not having to commute. And that two hours, yeah, as Charlotte said, getting to use that to prep is, is just so much more valuable. And I think just the flexibility to move a call around as well is so much more crucial because like in consulting, like clients are super demanding. You might have a meeting thrown in last minute that you can't move, especially when you're a junior like me. You, you're not moving meetings around. You work when you're told to, right? So like 
And I've been super thankful that my buddy has been able to accommodate. But part of that accommodation is just because it's just a phone call. You know, if, if he's agreed to come into into London and I have to move the call, like that, that's not really on. So no, it's been incredibly valuable in that sense. And for you, Mariam, um, would you say that kind of having seeing people volunteer in such a dynamic way, have you in any way been inspired to maybe volunteer yourself in the future or to kind of open yourself up to different opportunities that you might not have thought of um, before? Yeah, um, speaking of like volunteering, because I'm about to start uni into university, um, they sent an email saying that I could apply to mentor, mentor someone um, in six form or below. So that's something I've actually applied for. And I feel like that's because like, generally like the support the support I've received from Charlotte and from Inter University and from like people who have acted as mentors like throughout the years I've, I've like been like I want to I want to give that back so I figured I've applied for um mentoring someone who who would I guess need a mentor and that's something I hope to do. Brilliant thank you so much Mariam um we thank have you. time just for one more question before the end um so this is a question for all of you. Um, I've kind of alluded to this before, but what would you say the biggest surprise has been with virtual um, kind of volunteering or support during lockdown? What is something that surprised you the most? Um, Marion, start with you. Um, I think like with me, I thought it would be a bit more stressful, like having to like be on the phone and like especially if your family is all at home and like you don't want to like have like someone in the background like shouting or like screaming or like, making a lot of noise and it's like but I feel like with me I've been able I, I feel like I've learned new skills like, which is like it's not like much but it's like just like you know being able to manage like having like like organized like having like that boundaries like with your family and saying you know I just need half an hour or something where no one like comes into my room like barges in and makes like a loud disruption so I think like one of the one of the surprises for me was being able to manage it like having like online mentoring thank you Charlotte I think it for me it was the change because I was so used to meeting up and carrying out tasks and we had a plan and it was that sudden change that the plan was redundant and how quickly we adapt to that, that was my biggest surprise. Um, that really we like we adapted so well and we kind of got into a new rhythm really quickly. Um, and was just really pleased that we maintained the monthly meetings and we managed to kind of not change what we were doing because of lockdown, which was really positive. Brilliant. And then for you, Wes, finally. Yeah, I think I was, I've been incredibly on my toes during the conversations themselves. I think because having to apply, whilst I have experience in like the job market and applying to jobs, doing my CVs, cover letters, etc., it's it was all for like in-person things, and it's not for applying for virtual internships. And it's really really put me on my toes to work out how students can differentiate themselves in an insanely competitive job market. Um, so yeah, it's, I've just say I was so surprised by how difficult I found the questions I got to an answer but I mean yeah I thought I must admit going into the call I thought I would be able to drive some sort of answers very easily in terms of just applying what I did but realistically I'm I feel so lucky that I got the job I did when I did right because it's a more competitive it's a lot more competitive market now due to COVID but that said like there are still definitely synergies and parallels that I could draw between my experiences and the ones that my buddy's going to have to go into now so yeah, on the whole though, it was it was a little bit surprising in how difficult it was, but not unmanageable. Um, thank you so much. I want to thank um, you three for sharing your experiences and your volunteering stories. And it's lovely from to hear from you, Marion, that you'd like to volunteer in the future as well. Um, so it's really nice to hear that you've benefited, but also would like to um, continue volunteering as well. Um, so thank you to the three of you. Um, we're going to move on to our next panel. Um, so my colleague Sophie is going to chair that one. Um, so thank you very much. Thank, thank you.
Hello and welcome to the final section of our stories from the front line. My name is Sophie Houghton and I'm the cluster manager for the Midlands. I was a French and Spanish teacher in Hull before joining Inch University in 2015. In this section of the webinar, we will be hearing from schools and their experiences of supporting students under lockdown. We are very kindly joined by our panellists, who are Ruth Wheatley, who is currently teaching year two in a South London school. She did her PGCE at UCL in 2016 after 10 years working in PR and communications. Thank you to you both for joining us today. Uh, our first question is from a practical side of things. Can you explain what teaching or working in a school has looked like for you under lockdown? What we've done has evolved quite a lot since the schools closed. We started off, um, we quickly decided that we thought most families would benefit from a suggested timetable of activities um, each day but it was very we we really um, pushed the message that it was optional and that actually you know we, we, we recognized that all families would be able to get through everything and they might want to organize their days differently but um, most people seem to appreciate having a suggested way of organizing um, the learning and so we sent home an English activity a maths activity and a foundation um, subjects activity every day with a timetable um, and any work that came in um, I always gave specific feedback on to try and help to motivate the children um, and then we were also managing um, as Vanessa said we um, had a rotor in place at the start so we were, I was also sometimes in school and sometimes at home um, but then that sort of changed because I've got family at home they prioritised me staying at home so I became a, just a remote teacher um, and then we um, instated doing videos every day so every day I would send a video home to the children explaining what their learning was for that day and any difficult concepts I would go through um, with them but we were, only, we were only really doing, covering things that we'd already done at school. So we weren't introducing anything new, which I think is a particular challenge because it went on for so long. There's a lot of things that we never got to teach them and that they would have learned if they were in school. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that, that, it evolved like that. And then we were all back in school for the last sort of 10 days of term. We invited all of the children back um, in for transition sessions with their old teacher and their new teacher. So I spent some time with my class and met my class for September, um, which was really valuable. And it was really good for the children to do some socialising and be together and back in a strange routine, but uh, a routine outside of their home environment. Thank you. Um, I'm interested to hear about the difficulties that your students are facing at the moment. Are they new or different to what they were pre-lockdown? Um, I think they're really different for the younger children, actually. I think they've had a very different experience to what their life is normally like. School is a huge part of you know, their routine and they've been managing relationships in a way that they haven't had to before at home. It's very intense for them at home children living in quite cramped you know environments with lots of family members there all the time everybody trying to work at the same time um, mm. and feeling a bit frustrated that they can't you know a lot of them were really motivated and really enjoyed school and wanted to learn but it's very difficult for them at home to mm. do that and some of their parents weren't equipped in many ways to to support their learning and um, particularly if they had multiple children at school um, so that's been really difficult for them and I think that will be hard um, coming back as well because a lot of them will have become even more close to their family members and then sort of coming back in September might be quite challenging for them. Um, you know, in Key Stage 1, sometimes they do struggle to come in in the morning and that might be um, amplified potentially in September because they've spent so much time at home. Um, I really noticed when we were back to school um, a couple of weeks ago that some of them are really struggling with socialising. They've mm. forgotten how to do it. They don't know how to relate to other children anymore. Um, and, you know, children are really adaptable, so I'm sure they will get back into the groove, but I think some of them will find that quite hard. Um, and some children have been keeping in touch a lot on play dates and on Zoom calls, and some children really haven't. So that will be a challenge for some of them. And then, I mean, being at home, and if we do have to do remote learning again, we, I've had so many desperate emails from parents just saying that their children just can't motivate themselves to do anything at home. And it's really difficult without the, te the teacher seems to be the one that, 
that gets them to do stuff and the parents just can't do it yeah um, so that's been a huge issue for them um and a lot of children have missed out on a lot because their parents just don't know how to get them to sit down and do it thank you we've got a lot of our partners and colleagues in in widening participation from you from university teams um online now and a, a lot have asked about what can universities do in terms of outreach activities um, to support students at this moment? Um, some colleagues have mentioned what they can help to do with digital poverty, but what would be most useful in terms of activities for schools and learners when they come back in September? Um, Ruth, do you have any ideas? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Digital equipment, computing equipment, all of that stuff, we I have three laptops in my classroom and they're all broken. So, um, you know, those kinds of things, all schools are struggling with. And, you know, now we've got to find pay increases from an existing budgets and there's just going to be nothing. Um, so all of those things um, are genuinely needed um, and useful. And because we won't be able to share equipment, um, there will need to be more of it. So all of those things, just reaching out to schools and seeing what they need, I think. We've only got two minutes left, so I'm going to ask this question very briefly, and it probably requires a lot more time. But is have you got any plans of how you will deal with the missed curriculum? Any initial plans of what we put in place to September to help with the learning recovery? Ruth, have you got any insights first? Um, a little bit. I mean, there's we're being asked already to submit lists of children that we think will need interventions. So just a massive focus on English and maths but then trying to balance that with a lot more PSHE and well-being. But given that we're going to be sitting in the classroom all day with no assemblies, no transitions, no nothing, you know, there's a lot more learning time to be had. Um, it's just how you manage that with children um, who are really young. But yeah, I think there will be a lot more interventions um, for English and maths this year. Sadly, we've run out of time. Thank you so much for taking the time to share your experiences from working with students in the front line from schools. Um, during this webinar. I'm going to hand over to my colleague Charlotte to close us out, but thank you again. Thanks Sophie. Thank you Sophie. Uh, that brings our panel discussions to a close. On behalf of everyone at Int University, thank you so much to all the panellists for your valuable contributions and to our panel chairs for leading the conversations. I've thoroughly enjoyed hearing your first-hand experiences of studying, volunteering and teaching during lockdown and I think we've all got, um, we've all learned something that we can take away from this session. Finally, thank you to everyone for coming. I hope you have found it an interesting and insightful event. The webinar has been recorded and will be uploaded onto our YouTube channel. So we will send around the link for you to share with your colleagues or contacts who may be interested. Finally, we hope to see you all again at future Int University events and thank you once again for coming.